nine. You're hearing Dreamland with Art Bell. To participate in the program, call toll free one eight hundred six one eight eight two five five one eight hundred six one eight eight two five five. First time callers, area code seven zero two seven two seven one two two two, or the wild card line at seven zero two seven two seven one two nine five. This is the CBC Radio Network. Dreamland on a Sunday evening. Uh, particularly appropriate, I think, this evening. The name of our program derived from its physical adjacency to that area known as Dreamland, but with uh, dual application in the interview of Robert Monroe, who doesn't give that many interviews. It is a great pleasure, and we are going to get phone lines open uh, this hour and uh, let you ask quite a quite a few more questions. Uh, in that uh, in that hope, let me go ahead and take care of a little commercial obligation right now and in just a moment robert monroe once again robert monroe mr monroe yes uh... yes sir um... again it sure is a pleasure to have you on here well it's fun for me because i can um, uh, open up a lot of things and uh... don't have to be nearly so formal but remember radio is my old business oh it's a wonder i i love radio um, mr monroe um, somebody just sent me a fax and they're asking about two things one in your travels um, um, have you? Do you have any insight on two questions? One is: Have you ever met with a being or met a being that is not human? And oh that, yes, I have. <laughs> oh yes, you have. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and let's put it this way: It is indeed limited. But uh, the thing that I discovered, not unreasonably, is that. Uh, we are a curiosity to other beings. Uh, also, uh, uh, they have no particular desire to dominate us or something like that. Uh, we are a nice experimental uh, uh, species, as it were. Not much huh. more than that. That's uh, my impression. And the other is, um, do you have any better understanding because of all this? Of, of our creator or a god? I have a very much that. Uh, uh, one of the things that I had it all the time and didn't realize it, that is that uh, this, uh, this earth life system uh, is a, a created process and a creative process. And uh, I can, uh, you, as an engineer, go look at the leaf on a tree and see the design of it and what it aimed to do and that is it's, an, uh, it's a transducer as it were and it can stand all sorts of winds and everything else and when it's through for the year it drops off that's really a very scientific creative thing from my point of view but it is creative yes and then uh, uh, in working on this further one of the things that was so utterly fascinating to me that there are portions of this uh, Focus 27 beyond, uh, this is beyond time and space, believe me, it's the last vestige of, of human, active human thought. But there, there, I was astounded to discover that there is some type of energy field there that lets the human, the human mind, be a creator and, mm. and create carbon life. I was astounded to discover that. Moreover, uh, one of my, part of my contract, I guess it was, for the help that I have received, is the idea that going into, uh, going back and looking at the source of this creative process, and I got as far as uh, uh, what is I called the emitter, for lack of making a common term, and the creator or creative process is behind that, and there is an aperture through which one can go, but not until they're complete as the, the people waiting, or people, it's not quite the word, the beings waiting to go through there, massive things, uh, they pass some of this information along to me. And yes, that's one of the things that in turn has certainly come very much to my knowing, and that is that... Uh, I know, as I sit here, how our civilization uh, is restrained in terms of anything that's non-physical. We don't know anything about it in any way, shape, or form. 
and the options that are available to us uh, after we are no longer physical here. Uh, instead of being one of them, of course, is being the human addict and go back and live another life because you get addicted to being human. But there are so many other opportunities or options along that spectrum of energy. And one of them is to go and <laughs> I'll put it in the crude way. I try to make it in things ways that we can understand it of now. Course. And that is to shake the hand and say, well, this is a great job. Not prostrate and, and in adoration, but just to say, you're a real smart one. <laughs> All right. Wow. All right, Mr. Monroe, let's go to the phones. Every one of them's locked up and wants to talk to you. All so, right, go ahead. Uh, let's do it. On on the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Good uh, good evening. Hello there. This is Fritz calling. When Shirley MacLaine's five-hour television special, Out on a Limb, was aired way back in January of 87, some of her highlights was astral projection. It did make a lot of waves. Of course, her book with the same title did make the radio and television interview circuit years before that, and many, many millions of people were exposed to the OOB subject. Now, Robert, we need another catalyst to push that subject to the people's attention. After all, they could join the Cosmic College for free. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, uh, we, uh, we, are, we have not made a big point of being widely known, yet uh, uh, we did a, a slight study to indicate how many people users have been used in the methods that we have we have available and put forth out of demand but not out of advertising and uh, we figure that uh, there have been uh, a little over two and a half million users of these various types of uh, exercises on tape that we that we put throughout through the years and uh these are a means of beginning to do the very things that you're talking about. Um, Mr. Monroe, I recall uh, he mentioned Shirley MacLaine. Yeah, and I, oh, another thing that reminds me. I, I got very amused uh, that uh, in uh, Shirley's uh, movie, uh, in her picture, uh, I think she was the one that went into a uh, bookstore looking for uh, uh, something and... And right in front of her eyes was my book, Far Journeys, I think it was. Yes. It was very funny, and I thought, huh. <laughs> um, she uh, uh, alluded to the possibility or, or uh, claimed that she had traveled toward the moon, um, away from the Earth. Uh, Mr. Monroe, um, there are limitations uh, that we believe we face physically with travel to other planetary systems uh, with regard to the speed of light and all the rest of it. I, I'm sure you're well aware of that. Um, might out-of-body experiences be a way ultimately to travel uh, where otherwise we may never go? Absolutely. We, we did a great deal of that in the mid-70s. in the mid um, uh, uh, And these were engineers and physicists principally. And, uh, oh, we saw all the stuff on the moon before, uh, our, uh, shuttles and stuff got there. Uh, we went, to, went out to, uh, to Mars and out beyond that. It, the trouble is, we found that, uh, we got nervous about going beyond the solar system, knowing how we might get back, we might get lost, until we found out it was very simple. All we had to do is to think back to our physical body, even though we may be a uh, hundred light years away. And we'd have no problem at all getting back. And you didn't even to know. And you say, "Well, where have you been?" Out there, we could think. Where Out we there. Been. Well, maybe NASA should be talking to the Monroe Institute. On well, the... we've had some NASA people through. Oh, you have. Oh, on, yeah. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hello, uh, Mr. Bell. This is Tom out of Seattle. Yes, sir. Oh my God! I finally got through. Ah, uh, <laughs> this is incredible. Uh, uh, I've had out of body experiences. I think starting back when I was about. Yeah, they were nightmares and things like that. Yeah, and uh, as I progressed through my life, I remember about seventeen got more severe, and then uh, got away from home. And then in my late twenties, it got extremely severe. And you know, I, I didn't know they were out of my experience that there were nightmares and something, you know, freaky. And then all of a sudden, I started having control over it and kind of enjoying it. Good for you. Good for you. And then, all of a sudden, just like you were just saying earlier about that uh, actress, 
I walked into a bookstore, and lo and behold, i never been there before. I didn't know what I went in there for. There was your book in front of my eyes. Uh huh. very good. And, and I started studying it, and I started practicing it. Good for you. And I never felt so good spiritually or physically after I'd go out of my body and then come back. And then I started, over a period of time, losing the power. I don't know what I was doing wrong. I just felt there was, I don't know, it's, it's kind of hard to explain. There's something very weird. Uh, I was experimenting with it. I actually did two experiments, unscientifically, of course, on yeah. just a truck driver that proved it to other people that I actually got out of my body, went by him and did things and could see things while I was supposedly asleep, which I wasn't. <laughs> you know well, what I'm talking you, about. I can tell you one that I had to do out of desperation to be sure somebody understood it years and years ago. Uh, I went and I... Uh, pinched this woman in her side. Huh? <laughs> it left a bruise. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! And, uh, and so then there are. It is possible to have physical manifestations uh, during an out-of-body experience. Uh, uh, what I was doing, I uh, discovered years later, was that I was not pinching her physical body. I was pin pinching this other body. Oh! Uh, you see, and that's what left the bruise on the physical. But it was so uh, uh, it was so astonishing because I didn't think I pinched her that hard at all. It was on it was on uh, right just above her around her waist, up above her hips. <laughs> uh huh. Very discreet of you, sir. Yes, it was discreet. Of you. <laughs> all right, on the uh, wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hi, hello. Hey, John, uh, let me turn down my radio. Thank you. So remember to do that, everybody, right away, please. We have a delay system. Okay. Here. Um. Uh, I have a question for Robert Monroe. Yes. Um. I read his book, uh, both of his books, in fact. Uh, I read Journeys Out of the Body and also Far Journeys. And uh, Mr. Monroe, um, I, I have a question for you. Um, in your book, uh, Journeys Out of the Body, uh, you talk about this one incident where you go to, you have the intent of visiting this one person at this house. You give his initials as E.W. Yeah, mm hmm and uh you uh in before you do this you end up uh, going to this uh garage and um after that you wonder why you ended up there instead of visiting this one person and later you visit this area and you find out that uh there were these power primaries yes, near yes. Mm -hmm. near the garage well the thing is that go ahead and um Suppose and and you said they had a fairly high voltage. Yes. Mm -hmm. And then I, and then in the book you say, um, do electric fields attract the second body? And uh, is this the medium through which it travels? And I thought that was kind of interesting. Well, yes, I've uh, just learned, of course, that it's not electromagnetic. That's for sure. <laughs> it, it, it it we we we've become very acutely aware of an energy field that our science knows nothing about because of the simple reason they can't measure it. And uh, uh, the, you are using this right now. In other words, we uh, uh, Skip was talking about brainwave patterns, but these are generated by this other energy field, and they're the effect, and the causative factor is this other energy field. And there is no relationship to the electromagnetic no, energy? No, not as such. Uh -huh. All right. We uh tested that very thoroughly. On the wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Yes, good evening. This is uh, Brian from KOPE country down here in Medford. Yes, Brian, you have a question? Yes, I'm just curious if uh, he answered one of them partially. I had two of them, then you were talking about documented proof of this experience happening. And so if you have someone pinching a woman, but has there been scientific studies done with that that they have documented? And second, if you're out there somewhere and something happens to your physical body, what happens to you out there then? Mm -hmm. Well, it depends on how, how much it happens. One of the things that gets you back to your physical body, and uh, you you're out having a wonderful time doing all these things, and you get an urge, a signal to come back. And uh, uh, you, uh, as in the early times, you were concerned, oh, something's going wrong, the building's on fire, where my body is, and all this kind of thing. And you know what? The most common thing that pulls you back is the fact that your bladder is full. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Well, that'll pull you back and motivate you all the time. He also asked about documentation of physical effects. Uh, we have those. We don't make a, 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 a consistent practice of it, but they occur quite naturally in what we do. And we have quite a, a long line of them in terms of that. But you see, again, we're dealing with an energy that cannot be measured scientifically. So you can only measure the effects of the energy. You understand the difference? Yes, sir. All and right. That's the problem. All right. Wild card line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Hello. Hello, Mr. Bell. Hello, Mr. Monroe. Hello. Um, you know, I think you'd probably use, if, if I said this in the past, you'd probably think I was nuts. But No, I wouldn't. <laughs> um, I've had several, um, quite a few experiences with astral projection, and in which case other people actually experienced my being there. They didn't know it was me, and I never told them in advance that I was going to do what I did. Very good. As long as you did not tell them in, in advance, that's a very important key. Okay, but now, uh, that's it was it was incredible when I found out later, uh, and another friend that I had told that I did this was on the phone with us. Um, the three of us were on the phone, and, and it came, it sort of unfolded. But what I wanted to ask you, um, and Art had Richard Hoagland on, and I asked him when he was on about... The, the Viking lander on Mars and how uh, specific questions about the arm that was was supposedly jammed. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I actually had the experience that I went in 1978 to Mars mm -hmm. and un, and found that the the, jam, the arm was jammed and that I unjammed it. Hey, that's very good. But I I haven't to this day, and it seemed like Richard Hoagland didn't. Um, uh, came up with a very logical explanation of what happened, and he explained it over the air, so it may have just been my imagination. Mm -hmm. But I have very real experiences with it. Very and, good. And um, it was an incredible experience. Well, well I can sure. tell you the most common uh, illustration of of this other energy field of which we have a part and we manipulate a part, but we don't know we're doing it, and that is that uh, you will maybe of an evening say, well... I ought to call Bill tonight. And uh, five minutes after you think of that, the phone rings and says, Oh, no, this is Bill. <laughs> well, I thought I'd just give you a ring. And how many thousand times a day that happens in the human uh, uh, this human civilization? Well, is that is that precognition, or did you cause Bill to call you? You caused him to call on his, on his in his energy field, and you imprinted him, and... Uh, I must have had that happen, oh, at least 500 times in the last <laughs> 50 years. And in the last 50 years, how frequently have you sat down and wondered about the ethics of that? Well, that's a good question, isn't it? I think and so. And the other part of that question that you read, say, well, uh, uh, that's one of the things you see that's omitted within our culture and our civilization, and it's done a lot, lot more than we consciously think makes one wonder uh, how much action is really uh, uh, willful. On, on, on the toll-free line, you're on the air with Robert Monroe. Where are you calling from, please? This is Dave in Spokane, Art. Yes, hi, Dave. Again, well, I said when we were talking with Mr. Hoagland that my expertise wasn't in that area. It was more in this area, and here we are. Uh, it's good to know that you're not alone. <laughs> yeah, it's good it to know that I'm it. not a kook because I've been doing this. I'm 50. And I've been doing this since I was about five. Yeah. And, and then the entire gamut. I've, uh, I've probably got a million things I could say to you. Well, uh, what I would like you to do if you've gone that far or anyone else going that far, by all means, drop us a note. We would like to, we would indeed like to hear about it. Well, and, I certainly would. And, and uh, we would certainly appreciate it. And, and uh, uh, right, uh, right to the to uh, our uh, our uh, staff psychologist, uh, Darlene Miller, and uh, uh, the, all you have to do is it's Route One, Box One Seventy Five, Faber, Virginia Two Two Nine Three Eight. Route One, Box One Seven Five. Faber, F A B is in boy, E R, Virginia, 22938. F A B E R? Faber. Yeah. Faber, Faber. I, w I would say Faber. It's Faber, yeah, but uh -huh. they like it. in Virginia they call it Faber. <laughs> okay. Uh -huh. I have one question for you. Yeah. Very, very quickly. Very yeah. quickly, have you ever been to a place where it was totally dark? All right, and on, on, hold that answer, uh, Mr. Monroe, and we'll be right back with you. This is Dreamland on the CBC Radio Network, half hour mark. My guest is Robert Monroe. 
There's more. with your calls to Dreamland with Art Bell from the Kingdom of Nine. Well, we will continue with your calls or uh, and begin your calls shortly. My guest is Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute, and he's been describing uh, a very early experience or a series of experiences he had with journeys out of the body. And this is um, really, I guess, the genesis of the Monroe Institute, internationally famed, uh, for what it does, and uh, Mr. Monroe, are you there? Oh, I think I'm here anyway. Oh, you you are. Although I suppose with you, one never knows for sure. No, they know for sure. I, that I've gotten <laughs> past that now. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me, um, there's been a lot of uh, uh, scientific study, and some not so scientific, of the near death experience. Yes. And and you mentioned that you thought it might have been an NDE that you were having. Um, is there a relationship? Uh, to the NDE? Uh, not, uh, not in the sense that uh, it's commonly been researched in recent years. Uh, it, it, it's a different kind of thing. We were very methodical. I, you got to understand that simultaneously with all of this, uh, I, in turn, was operating a company, and we moved out of the broadcasting uh, program production, and it, instead of going to the West Coast, we moved down to where we had three radio stations down in Virginia and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. And uh, we set up a facility here and began uh, a very serious research. And the first thing that we found out uh, was that uh, conventional science did not have any means of measuring anything like this at all. Right. The closest thing uh, was the uh, biological and electrical signs, and we got into those uh, relatively early. But in going down to Virginia, then we did uh, set up a research facility where we could indeed uh, uh, see if it was possible to measure other people in similar states. And in the beginning of that, uh, uh, we enlisted a uh, uh, Ph.D. doctor, young friend, uh, who's been a friend ever since, back in the, back in the 60s. And we began some very serious experimentation. And uh, uh, a man by the name of Charlie Tart. I don't know whether he's very Charlie or not. No, sir. Were you able to actually document any biological changes that occurred during this state? No, uh, we began to match them up, and we found uh, uh, that, generally speaking, uh, we uh, also developed methods and techniques, but uh, we had an average of about eight to ten subjects that we were using constantly in the 60s uh -huh. and 70s down in Virginia, in Richmond, and then in Charlottesville. Incidentally, uh, what brought us into Charlottesville is that we got into the cable business. Oh, yes. <laughs> so. Yes, I'm very familiar with it. I guess we've been down similar roads. My background is in uh, cable television and broadcasting. And you know, uh, uh, even even then, uh, in the whole idea we were microwaving signals in, uh, I thought, aha, someday that's what uh, cable's going to be. It'll be satellite stuff. Anyway, uh, to make it short, there, we, there was no means of measuring other than the conventional signals. And we found one of the things, there were two states that uh, came out biologically, and I'll be that, I mean chemically and electrically. One of them was uh, uh, dreaming sleep, and that was when one was near the physical body. The second one was a stage four sleep, which is deep sleep. Delta sleep, and that is when the major uh, uh, activity in what we we coined the phrase and it became generic. Uh, we didn't like to call it the old phrase of astral traveling because it had too much of a mystical flavor. Mm -hmm. So we uh, coined the term out of body, which has now become generic, as you know. But uh, what we found is that uh, that. The, these extended distance type of, of uh, activity all had to do with stage four sleep. And how, that, 
Uh, if, if I might, um, Mr. Monroe, how were you actually able to document that? If, if a person is there sleeping, how do you correlate uh, the time of the out-of-body experience with a particular uh, state of sleep? Well, it was very simple. It was, in, in the 60s, it became a lot simpler than it might seem at first. Uh, uh, we took various types of, uh, of body measurements, uh, electrical measurements, and, and uh, occasionally then we got into uh, EG, EEG patterns, but, but we did not have the equipment at that time in, in, uh, to be able to do it properly. Anyway, uh, what we found is that when a person was in one stage of sleep, uh, they that are subjects who in turn became proficient, I might add, in uh, performing this out-of-body. Uh, they took, uh, we took readings on them in these activities that they were doing and matched them up with the uh, biological signs of these two different stages of sleep. And this is where we began to get the connection mm-hmm. that, uh, that led us to really where we are now. But uh, through those uh, those early periods, uh, the uh, we did some of it. Uh, uh, we did it at UVA, for example, back in the early days in the '60s, and that's where we at least got the beginnings of working on an EEG pattern. Uh, out of that, through the uh, we attracted attention uh, from uh, various uh, scientific people uh, as a result of. Uh, it's just simply a word spreading that we were looking at something from a different point of view as against a uh, strictly mystical approach to it. How was the conventional scientific community um, uh, reacting uh, to your work then? Uh, they uh, uh, reacted with a great deal of skepticism until uh, one uh, and more of them began to experience the thing through the system that we were slowly, painfully developing. And uh, we, um, it was kind of a thing that uh, working on a means of getting past the hard rocks that I had encountered. And yes. the first one, of course, is fear, and the second one is, is the reality of what it is. And it didn't take nearly so much uh, work to have people determine the reality. And we're not talking about uh, uh, college students, which are often the typical subjects. These are people that, uh, one way or another, had, had heard about what we were doing and became interested in it, like a physicist and psychologist at Al. And that was the beginning back in the 60s. And moving slowly through the 60s, we uh, developed means of inducing these various states. And uh, in inducing those states, uh, we got a very simple. The first one was, and we gave them labels so they would be impartial in terms of states of consciousness. And the first one is very simple. We call it mind awake and body asleep. And this is what we call focus 10. And uh, so we did establish these different types of uh, states of consciousness that we could induce by using these very particular sound patterns. And so by the 70s, we had a... uh, uh, It had spread simply because the word would get out to among the scientific community and those who uh, were curious or had something similar happen to them uh, were attracted to our work. All right. Uh, are these the sounds uh, that are now known as the hemi-sync tapes? The hemi-sync tapes. In other words, hemi-sync, yes. H- hemi as in hemisphere of the That's brain, right. I, I That's take That's right. It. And what, the, uh, the, what these patterns we did find was that uh, it's a special method that we didn't invent uh, what's called a binaural beat, but we did indeed use that as a system of a means of getting these low-frequency vibrational patterns into the brain. Uh, in other words, a binaural beat yes. uh, it puts, a, say, a 100 hertz signal in one ear, which you can hear, and a 104 hertz signal in the other ear, and the brain has to uh, synthesize that 4 hertz differential. That's what a binaural beat is. So you end up with a, uh, a four hertz um, that the brain itself uh, hears? It would be, uh, the brain itself has to synthesize that by uh, that synchronization of the hemispheres because one signal is in one ear and the, uh, the other signal is in the opposite ear and the net differential. Yes. And I said we didn't invent that. It's just the 
actual waveform are the ones that uh, we put together. Okay, then is it the 4 hertz uh, signal that the brain hears that actually enables or, or assists it's, in, a, in, in attaining the state you're talking about? Yeah, it's a combination. Uh, we uh, now use multiple combinations thereof. But uh, that's, uh, that's how we first began, by getting these very simple uh, combination patterns going. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, in terms of where that uh, got is a, quite an interesting story, but uh, i bring you up through the years to give you an idea of where we are now. We have a 20-channel EEG system and a, uh, an isolation booth where we have and got a great deal of the RF out of it, and we use that in uh, an awful lot of research. And uh, I'll turn you over to Skip Atwater and let him talk a little bit about the research patterns that will help. All right. Uh, I, I would love that. Uh, right. and, and go right ahead. Uh, coming is Skip Atwater. And um, uh, Skip Atwater, um, are you there? Yes. Uh, Skip, um, what uh, what division uh, do you head up for, Mr. Monroe? This is the at this research team? division that you mentioned earlier in your introduction. Yes, um, fascinating stuff that that you folks are doing. Um, what can you what can you tell us about the present state of your research? In other words, what all this has led to? Yes, the present day research has really been. Uh, uh, due to the age of computers, all the work that Mr. Monroe had done over the two decades uh, prior to the invention of the computer world and analysis is now being validated. He has always been a man ahead of his time, as it were, and the notions he had about what were going on, what was going on, are now uh, being proven to be true by looking at the brainwave states through computerized electroencephalography, actually measuring uh, brain waves with a brain mapping system uh, that runs off a computer, not the charts and the squiggly lines that we've all seen on uh, drug commercials on TV and things like that, but uh, actual computerized analysis of the brain wave states. What, uh, what are you actually able to chart? This is fascinating. What can you chart about the brain besides uh, electrical activity? Well, we can uh, see how the sound patterns originally invented by Mr. Monroe affect the change in the patterns of the brain, and those changes then have been identified over the years as being characteristic of states of consciousness. So you can actually see dissociative states of consciousness and transcendent states of consciousness as they're experienced by the people reflected in their brainwave states. Wow. Um, that's a, a significant, uh, significant accomplishment. Um, what what if, 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 if somebody were there and uh, we were actually uh, observing this underway what uh, how are you able to document this uh, using a computer uh, is it just that I'm, I'm totally lost in other words uh, getting a little bit technical with me if you can what exactly do you look at what we do is watch an overall flowing pattern of brain waves um, the uh, brain waves as a result of electrical neuron firings in all levels of the brain and are reflected up on the scalp uh, as activity of the brain. Not all things actually occur in the neocortex or that gray layer over the top of the brain. The brain is active electrically in regions down deep inside. So what you see as the pattern and activity on the top of the scalp where we put our electrodes is a result of all that activity in the brain. So it actually takes the computer to figure out all that information. Right. Uh, but that is, in essence, what an EEG does uh, as well, is it not? In what way does the point you've come to differ from an EEG? Well, this is uh, the state of the art of EEG work in terms of analysis. It's not just the squiggly line graphs. You can take and make a map of activity, a color topographic map, like you might see a weather map of the United States as the clouds pass over it and the 
weather fronts pass over it, you can see that same type of information passing over the scalp and over the surface of the brain. And by analyzing those changing patterns uh, based on known concepts of brain activity, you can see the states of consciousness change as people move, move through them in response to the hemisync system. All right. When somebody achieves this state and is, in fact, traveling as Mr. Monroe has, yeah. what changes are, do, you, do you document? People usually start out uh, with what we call the alpha state, where in the back of the head there is high amplitude alpha as they're just laying there resting before moving into this state. That pattern changes as they move into what the sleep researchers call stage four sleep and what the consciousness researchers would call a dissociative state of consciousness or dissociating from the physical awareness of the body. That results in a high amplitude delta frequency happening right on the top of the head. Wow. Um, all right. Um, that's that's quite incredible. And so, where do you go from here in your research? Uh, as you're you're going to, I'm sure, continue to try to document this. What what is ahead for the institute? Well, the uh, first task five years ago, when all this became a feasible thing to do to actually map the activity of the brain as it responded to the stimulus of the hemisync process, was to uh, improve the tapes by measuring the population of people and then changing those patterns slightly and improving the process that Mr. Monroe had discovered some years previously. Uh -huh. uh, I, I want to ask you a question. Do we have uh, more than one telephone online now? Uh, right now there is, yes. Yes, uh, could we, I'm, I'm sorry to ask, uh, but, but would it be possible to have just one phone at a time online? It's uh, reducing the audio too far. All right, hold on and I'll get off. and, and uh... Well, by all means, come back. I'll come back. <laughs> all right. Is that a little better now? That's, that's quite a bit better, yes, thank you. All right. Um, um, the situation has kind of progressed from there, and now we are able to uh, record the brain waves of people who have specific talents, talents like Mr. Monroe's for traveling out of his body. But included in that are other human talents, like a concert pianist or an architect or a noted author or a computer programmer. And by mapping the patterns of those, we are trying to develop sounds that might be able to pass these talents on to other people. Wow. Wow. Uh, now, that's quite a line of research uh, to be following. How are you able to... And uh, I, I'm really uh, wandering around here because I don't know what I'm... I'm, I'm really don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, I'm So excuse the ignorance, but how are you able to map, for example... Uh, somebody with a great computer talent or somebody uh, who's a concert pianist, and what differences are you able to note between that in individual and anybody else? Yes, that's uh, ongoing research. What we try to get them to do is to perform their talent while being uh, mapped, while being recorded. We would record a, a baseline recording when they're not performing their particular art Right. and then make a recording while they're performing their art. And if we can get 5, 6, 12 pianists that can play the piano just exquisitely and we notice a commonality between that pattern that differs from the general population while they do that, then we have identified a specific state of consciousness that... Kingdom of Nye. This is Dreamland with Art Bell on the CBC Radio Network. Well, good evening, everybody. The Monroe Institute travels from the body. The Monroe Institute was founded by Robert Monroe, a former broadcasting executive who began to undergo spontaneous experiences in 1958 that drastically altered his life, unpredictably and without willing it. 
Mr. Monroe found himself leaving his physical body via a second body to explore locales unbounded by conventional concepts of time and space. He has documented these experiences in Journeys Out of the Body, a Doubleday book, in 1971, published in eight languages worldwide, and in Far Journeys, Doubleday, 1985. The Monroe Institute had its origins in the Research and Development Division of Interstate Industries Incorporated, which began investigating methods and techniques of accelerated learning in the late 1950s. That investigation led to some remarkable discoveries that dealt with the very nature of human consciousness. As a result, the basis of the research effort was expanded considerably. In 1971, the Institute was created to supplement that research effort. As a school, the Monroe Institute is composed of two divisions, and we will hear from spokesmen of both. The Education Division, which conducts classes and seminars and disseminates tapes and other materials in direct application of the methods it has developed. And the Research Division, which conducts ongoing studies in enhancement of human consciousness and the development of methods and techniques that may result in practical use thereof. And that uh, is from uh, a Monroe Institute uh, pamphlet. And here, all the way from Faber, Virginia, is Robert Monroe. Uh, Mr. Monroe, welcome to the program. It is an honor. Well, I'm glad to be here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Gia, do we have more than one person on the phone line here? Because it's very, uh, it's very weak. It's very weak? Very weak, yes. Well, we can... Uh, uh, we can Take one out and see what happens. Okay, we're going to have to do that because I can't hear you. Uh, Is better now? Uh, that's a little bit better. Uh, are you now the only uh, phone line on? Now I'm the only phone line on. Oh, that is much, much better. All right. Much better. Anyway, welcome. Uh, it sure is an honor to have you here, uh, Mr. Monroe. Well, uh, uh, I don't know what's gonna, going to happen after all that meteor stuff. <laughs> 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 Yes, isn't that, uh, isn't that quite the occurrence? That was very, very interesting. Um, Mr. Monroe, um, if you would please take us all back and tell us how this began for you. Well, it, uh, it's uh, an odd thing because it was uh, unexpected is a better way to put it. Uh, back in uh, 1956, uh, my company was looking for some uh, uh, diversive type of things to do, so we... I got the idea that perhaps we could, in turn, uh, uh, help people learn during sleep. So, being a specialist in sound, because of all of our our company history, uh, we, in turn, obviously began to use sound. First thing we found out in order to help people to get to sleep, we got to get them to sleep. So, what we did was develop some particular sound waveforms that help people go easily into sleep, and then we were beginning to test that after that. Uh, I, being one of the chief subjects, uh, uh, oh, uh, uh, that we started in 56, and in uh, 1958, I began to notice some odd effects of it. Oh. And uh, it was a funny kind of uh, vibration, and that's what it felt like, except it wasn't a physical vibration. And uh, I went uh, to my favorite doctors and so on, and they said, oh, no, you're fine, don't worry. And uh, so I finally had the courage to wait to see what this, instead of forcing myself out of this vibration, I uh, finally said, well, if it's going to kill me, I'll let it kill me, and I'll have to try it. So I stayed with it, and after about five minutes, it faded out. And uh, so, therefore, I, I tolerated it when it went from, uh, and it didn't happen every night, maybe, oh, once or twice a week or something like that, so... I had I would wait till it completed and then after it was through uh, or faded out well then I'd go to sleep and on one fateful night in September of '58 uh, I was on a Friday night waiting uh, for this to fade away so that I could go to sleep calmly and in the midst of that I uh, began to think well tomorrow was Saturday and being a uh, sailplane pilot and member of up in the New York area, uh, I was thinking that a cold front had come through and there'd be a nice, beautiful ridge lift and thermal the next day and on a Saturday, and I'd be flying around in gliders and sailplanes. And as I was thinking how nice that would be in the, the 
uh, sense of soaring power that there is in a thermal in a glider. Uh, all of a sudden, I felt my uh, myself bumping against something, and I looked around, and uh, to my surprise, I was uh, on some type of flat surface. And I said, "I wonder what this is. This is a strange kind of a dream. I'm fully conscious." <laughs> And uh, then I looked around and I thought, well, here is a, this is a, a strange thing to dream. Here's the thing that looks like a, a, a fountain coming out of the, out of the uh, floor, as it were. And then I suddenly, with a shock, realized that the, what I thought was the fountain was the chandelier in the, in the bedroom. Oh, my. And so I turned with utter uh, astonishment and rolled over it and... I had in that bumping against the ceiling, I looked down, and there in the um, bed below, there I was in the bed below, and there was my wife lying in bed beside me. Except that as the, I saw it at first, I didn't think that. I didn't recognize myself, because I here I was bouncing against the ceiling. What was that? <laughs> so my first thought was, what a dream. I wonder who I'm dreaming is in my bed with my wife. <laughs> And yes. uh, after a, a sudden little poster look, and I'm still against the ceiling, I realized this is the man in bed with my wife was I. So I was frightened. I said, I'm dying. This is a dying process, and I'm mm. not ready to die yet. So I fought my way vigorously, swimming down through the air, as it were, and, and somehow popped back in my body. And I sat up and looked around, and there's my wife, soundly asleep, and I looked up, and there's the ceiling with a chandelier. Mm. And I obviously didn't get to sleep that night. <laughs> what an incredible experience. Now, you, you said that you were experimenting with some sounds uh, or some audio in order to assist you with sleep. Can you, can you amplify on that? What were you doing? And was well, this was a, 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 a pattern that we had, de we had developed, but I hadn't, I hadn't done anything with it for over a year, and nobody else had, uh, had anything remotely like this particular effect. Okay, so it was not due to that, and whatever was occurring to you was utterly spontaneous? It seems that way. In other words, I, we were looking for any types of, uh, of possible answers, and that was when we thought, well, that would affect uh, uh, other people, because we had about 100 subjects that we had used in it, but it didn't uh, affect anybody else anywhere, not even the semblance of it. Hmm. So anyway, <coughs> excuse me, uh, the uh, most important thing was that uh, I was so sure that that uh, that that was a beginning of a dying process, and I was terrified. And, and you can't imagine how terror-stricken one can be or panic-stricken, because I uh, every time I have to go to doctor, not finding out still any uh, interesting comment about it. Uh, I had great trouble of letting myself let that happen, and let it, and finding that if I released or just let go a little bit when that took place I would float out of my body and each time I thought I was dying so anyway uh, that went back into more physical exams and uh, I finally got the courage to uh, go to a doctor a, a psychiatrist friend in New York named Louis Wolberg and uh, he said well uh, he says I can tell you one thing he says I know that you, I know that you're sane uh, I know you too well, so don't worry about any psychotic thing because you're not that type. So I, like I said, well, what will I do? He says, I says, I don't know. <laughs> you can go into psychiatry, have take psychiatry and find it if you want. It might take a little while, but and, and I said, well, I'll think about it. So anyway, uh, after about ten additional episodes, something like that, I finally realized that this floating out and floating around the room was not going to kill me because I could think a certain way and I'd get back in my physical body. Until that moment, though, it must have been absolutely terrifying. It was, and and I could not, I couldn't get, uh, being very much an engineering type, I couldn't find any uh, any common scientific answers for it. Uh, the only one was is, is uh, dualism, psychosis, and things like that. Mm -hmm. So that was the big problem because I couldn't find. Uh, an appropriate answer. So uh, after about the tenth time, I finally realized, well, this is not going to kill me. I'm not in the death process. Well, that made something else come up entirely worse, and that's curiosity. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm, and, I'm sure it did, yes. Uh, it's, it's not going to carry it. What is it? Anyway, uh, so uh, I began to experiment with it uh, around the room and so on. And just, I, could, I found I could only go a certain distance away from my physical body. And was as if there were something holding me back, and I finally answered that because I realized what it was. And the other part of the life secrets, as it were, uh, I, the thing that was holding me so heavily was that I had this very strong sensual sexual urge, and uh, uh, I, of course, obviously tried to wake my wife. <laughs> <laughs> Had no luck there, and that that was binding you. Uh... It was keeping me close to my physical body because it was related to a, a physical drive. Anyway, I used the uh, old Gene Autry principle on that finally, and, and to, to overcome my need to go beyond thirty feet from the body. And you probably don't know the Gene Autry technique, do you? No, sir, I don't. No, you're, you're too young. Uh, Gene Autry uh, had a, uh, a uh, thing where, in turn, he did a lot of... You know who I'm talking about. Oh, of course. Yeah, well, he, he had a formula that was very, very effective for uh, uh, pre-puberty children who came to see his uh, movies on Saturday afternoon and in, in a movie house, no TV. To make it very short, what the, the technique was that... Uh, he in the movie he would meet a girl, and then uh, he would have his big fight with the bad guy, and he would overcome the bad guy. And uh, after he overcame them, he'd go to the girl and she'd say, "Oh, Gene, you're so wonderful." She'd look up with pursed lips at him, and Gene would look down, and uh, all the audience and he learned this how who can tell through the years, but. All the girls were going, ah, and all the boys would say, oh, he ain't going to kiss her, is he? <laughs> so what he did, learning that, he had a formula that fit his, his pictures, that what he did, he says he said to the girl, honey, I love you, and I'll, I'll, and I'll get to you later, but first, I want to sing you a song. And so he picked up his guitar and started singing, and they rode off into the sunset, and everybody was satisfied. So my answer, um, finally getting down to that, was there's an easy answer. Fine, I'll say to this sexual drive of mine, uh, I'll get to you later. But first, I want to do this other. Yeah. And sure enough, it worked. So you, in other words, you conquered it psychologically. And, That's right. And that released you. That's right. Then what? Then became a series of experiments, and and, uh, uh, and I uh, took this research team that I had and turned them loose and trying to find information about this. And uh, uh, we found that uh, quite quickly that there was uh, uh, what was an underground, as it were, and then we're talking back, back in the 50s, or 59, 50, 59, uh, which uh, was the area where all the, uh, you'd find the uh, uh, trans people and all types of, types of uh, mystical things and Sure. And uh, uh, call it dreamland if you want. Or <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, uh, after a long uh, period of time, we found out the usual ones there, and I had a, uh, meetings with the... Uh, that was right at the beginnings of parapsychology. And uh, uh, I went down and met with J.B. Ryan, for example. I don't know whether you know the name or not. No, sir. Well, he was the leading figure in parapsychology in that era, about 1960, I guess, 50, 50, Anyway, to make it short, uh, I met with him, and uh, he said uh, on a Saturday at Duke University, and he was very, he says, it's very, indeed, very interesting, but he says, it's, it's not my department. And uh, I said, well, uh, uh, what is your department? He says, oh, we, uh, we work with cards. And I said, and I, I said, oh, thinking that I had a poker game the night before, <laughs> and uh, he explained how they were have subjects testing subjects for uh, psychic ability by uh, having them read cards before they're turned over and this kind of thing. Oh yes, I'm familiar with that. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so I left, and uh, uh, as I was going out the door, this 
research assistant of Dr. Ryan's uh, opening the door to get me out. Says, Mr. Monroe, and I says, what? He says, don't worry about it. I says, what? Why? He says, I do it too. <laughs> and that was the first person I ever heard who had ever done anything like it. And then, then following up that, uh, mind you now, the fear had faded away and was uh, trying to do something about it. It was another question. So I had another friend, a psychologist, a name uh, Foster Bradshaw, and I finally got the courage to talk to him about it. And he says, oh, that's nothing new. I says, well, I'm glad to hear that. And he says, uh, 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 it's, uh, there's a very easy way to handle it. And I says, what do you mean? He says, this oh, you go over to India. That's it. And you live with a, in a, uh, ashram with a guru for about uh, some time, and he'll tell you all, to get it all fixed up in your mind. Uh huh. And I said, well, thinking, uh, about my business and my home and my wife and two children. And, uh, I said, well, how long would this take? He says, well, that's not important how long it takes. Well, I says, how long do you think it would take? And he says, well, oh, maybe 10 to 15 to 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> and I had my usual run with him, and I said, well, Brad, uh, what would you do? And Noah, knowing that he has a wife who had two grand pianos, and that's why he's an industrial psychologist in New York, uh, maintain things like that. I said, what would you do, Brad? He looked at me with this lofty, all lofty smile and says, it's not my problem, it's yours. <laughs> Yeah, nice answer. Uh, how much experimentation had you begun to do with this? In other words, um, once you realized it wasn't going to kill you, as you continued to have these experiences, what did you try to do? Well, I, I tried the very simple things, obviously, at first, and that is uh, uh, going uh, through the walls in the house and out and around and, and stretching outward and going upward, obviously, in the uh, being a... Uh, pilot in airplanes that it was interesting to go up and go and play in the clouds. Uh. You see, because I no longer had the fear. But I gradually began to expand it, and my main key in the in the early era was to get stuff I could verify, uh, such as uh, go to some uh, person's house and, and visit with them and try to make, uh, uh, make some kind of appearance or get information and bring it back. Were you able to do that? Very much so. And to my very pleasant surprise, as a matter of fact, and, uh, in several cases I appeared as a, a people perceived, not knowing that I was there. That's the point. I didn't announce that uh, I was going to go visit them that particular evening or whatever, but I appeared as, as sort of a, uh, a little bit of a swirling gray mist, and that's why they saw me, not as a physical person, wow. but as a gray mist. Wow. Anyway, uh, it's most important to recognize that it was fully a year of this, type of experimentation before I myself was convinced of the reality of it, that 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 it was not an hallucination or a, a wild dreaming state or whatever. It took a full year of this before I said, yes, this is real. Did you, uh, as time went on, were you more easily able to attain the state uh, where you would uh, be able to travel out of body? Oh, yes, very much. That's what all of this was. And uh, 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 then I got, uh, as, as it, we moved into the early 60s on it, well, we began to do all different types of experimentation on uh, going to the coast and back and everything else. Huh. Oh, that's remarkable. Mr. Monroe, hold on just a moment. We'll be right back to you. We're interviewing Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute. This is Dreamland. Mr. Monroe, if you are there, we are now right at the top of the hour. And so we're going to pause uh, for about five minutes and do the news and so forth and so on and, uh, and come right back. So uh, stay put, relax for a few minutes. We'll be right back to you, okay? Very good. All right, great. Uh, Mr. Monroe, Robert Monroe of the Monroe Institute, back in a moment as we talk about states of consciousness that, uh, that perhaps can be achieved by you, perhaps by everybody, if only they knew how to do it. Talk about uh, inexpensive travel. This is Dreamland.
Well, we're back again, and it's um, important to take up this other very important aspect of Lifeline. And it is, again, here we go, starting something else. We inserted into it what we call the DEC, which is uh, our acronym for the Dolphin Energy Club. The interesting process that is the Dolphin Energy Club is one where it is a mixture of not just uh, the various methods that we've developed over the years, but uh, from uh, people in Menninger and also, uh, say, some of Symington's work and put together into a format that helps one learn how, first of all, to develop a tool to go into the healing process. Once having learned that tool, the next step is is to use it upon one's own self to maintain physical and mental health. And the second thing is to go into healing others. Now, the interesting thing about this whole Dolphin Energy Club, we, which we call the deck, is that it's based upon a statistic. Uh, if you have five people who are proficient in healing others, you have a magnificent thing. But if you only have one in five who is proficient at healing from a distance, then that's very important. If you had only one in ten, it is a statistic. So what the Dolphin Energy Club envisions is not having five, not having ten, but say a hundred or two hundred or five hundred different individuals or even a thousand who in turn will provide this healing energy for various people in and uh, only those incidentally who ask for it we did a an, an exercise many years ago and many means 15 years ago whereby we had a test on the potentials of being able to transmit energy from one person to another and we had a series of tests whereby a person here in Virginia would be in essence in focus 15 and would create rings of energy and would aim them at a person in California. Now, the important part was that the person in California knew that this was going to take place, but they didn't know when. So we very carefully had a timing system so that the person here in our lab would, in turn, exercise this. And it, it came as a visualization process where... These were rings of energy spaced, what, who knows, five or ten feet apart, and were arcing over the horizon to this recipient. And uh, once started, once the process then, uh, these series of glowing rings would be uh, form this arc as they went on over the horizon to the recipient. And this, there was not anything other than the be, the ability to perceive the energy. The energy at that point didn't had no purpose whatsoever except as a test. And we found that over, over some 50 tests, I think that we ran, that of those, something like 23 of those, the recipient perceived, and these were different recipients, not all the same one, perceived receiving the energy at the identical time that the person transmitted it. And not knowing when it was they were expecting it, that's the important thing too, but that they were able to identify when they did receive it was most, most fascinating. So this led to the fact that what can we do with the kind of uh, remote energy like that from one individual to another? And this is what the deck or the Dolphin Energy Club does. Incidentally, we selected the dolphin because it's uh, it is a non-human intelligence existing here on our planet Earth, first of all, and second, as far as anybody can tell, they're reasonably friendly and interested in humans, and third, that they uh, apparently have an intelligence uh, that is at least as close to ours and perhaps superior. That's a lot of discussion that goes on about that. So here we have an impartial, friendly symbol. That was the point. Not another human but an impartial in, uh, 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 icon, whatever you want to call it. And so, in essence, uh, the deck process teaches you to form uh, 
a little miniature, uh, fully alive energy dolphin that will go into either your system or the system of another and conduct all sorts of healing processes, whatever is needed. And so this is how we do. We get into learning how to create this dolphin and to how to direct it. This uh, was and initially was a, a one basic part to the lifeline process. And what we did there after learning it, they first of all, every morning, uh, subsequent to the learning the process, uh, went into healing themselves. And each night we had a session where they all uh, healed some other person who had requested it. The interesting thing is, back to the statistic, if we had 14 people there, and granted this was very much a uh, a group that was not uh, a random choice. This was a group who had already uh, considerable experience in applying energy and consciousness. So it was a good point. But let's say out of the 14 there may have been, uh, let's say, uh, uh, two, let's say, who were or became proficient at this, that would be enough if there were two that could do it. So if we multiply that by by a factor of 10, and that would be that there would be <clears throat> 20 people, and we have exponentially, exponentially increased the potential for this energy system of healing to actually work by increasing its amplitude, as it were, or its voltage, or whatever you want us to call it. So if you think about a goal that in terms of this, that if we had, instead of uh, uh, the factor of 10, a factor of 100, and, and 1,400, then we would have uh, 200 people working simultaneously to perform this function. Uh, we're getting past the laws of probability and into the areas of certainty, and this gets fascinating. That's the Dolphin Energy Club. <coughs> now, my friends, uh, how did it work from your point of view, darling? I think it worked very well. The reports were just uniformly very positive. First, about the quality of the tapes themselves. People found that it was they were conducive to creating a very powerful focus 10 state wherein they could do this kind of work. Um, we also uh, were able to provide an opportunity for the professional division members to have the experience of both uh, the deck yourself, as we've come to call it, and the deck others tapes, and with very positive reports. I think I really, in terms of watching the program and how the week evolved, um, doing that healing yourself exercise every morning set a wonderful tone for the day because people were becoming physically, mentally, and emotionally balanced, and it was a way of their own preparation as they moved into then the, the work of the retrieval process. So. That actually, as I think about it now, may have been another reason why the emotional components were, were so nicely in place in terms of the work they were doing, because they were doing that kind of balancing with the deck exercise That's as they started designed. each then, morning. Then you think that it, it did help in that respect, because that was the design to do yes, that. Yes, and it very possibly that may have been a large part of that. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then what was interesting to me about the group work, uh, we were in a, a circle. Uh, in David Francis in the evening before we did the evening program and would do the deck exercise to uh, send this healing energy to someone who had requested it. And the only information they had was the name or and or the picture of the person requesting it. They didn't, they had not been told ahead of time what the particular problem was or request was for. And a number of people during that, re re following the uh, exercise, would actually have seen the map, the living body map of the person could identify very precisely the area that was in need of attention and could get very specific details that they had not even had going into it. So that was very interesting as well. Mm -hmm. Not that we would not have had that knowledge. That's right. Dina, what did you think of it? Oh, it, uh, it worked very well. Um, um, the deck yourself uh, in the morning um, seemed to really 
help folks concentrate on themselves and their own balance in their own um, way of feeling and thinking and their physical activity which really helped to set up and prepare them um, not only for the day but also gave them a tool so that they could be practicing this on a daily basis um, the uh, several people um, reported uh, finding areas in their own bodies in their own emotional states that they were able to um, affect change in uh, very readily and that was most gratifying for them and certainly for us too well so it, it, it well it really was a two-pronged thing but that did interact one with the other which is important thing we have another thing that is emerging which is a the last lifeline for the year uh, uh, is scheduled to be attended by Elizabeth Kubler Ross and I'm sure all of you know Elizabeth and her her pattern of working for all these years among uh, the uh, whole death and dying process uh, what she doesn't know yet because I haven't told her about this and so but so it may be that you who hear this tape may know it before she does is that there is an epilogue to lifeline and that epilogue is something we have been trying to decide upon for many many years and we've tested it here and there over the years and that is a process whereby uh, we can help this individual have certain rights that are not necessarily within our Constitution but indeed the question of that right has come up and that is that as you all know uh, within our present cultural concept that uh, the question of right to die has been coming up again and again and again books are being written about it and there's the hemlock society that will provide you means to uh, take this right into your own hands and all sorts of things the uh, epilogue perhaps to lifeline is a method that we will probably provide uh, in some form on tape which will help a person exercise the right to die they will not have to use anything but this tape to learn the process of exiting and departing when they want to do so and uh, the included in that pattern is also a support system for uh, the friends and loved ones of that person who is uh, getting ready and uh, planning to depart so that the exit can be an entirely different thing for that person than it is con uh, in our conventional mode uh, very tra traumatic this could be if properly designed and if properly used could be uh, indeed uh, a point and you know exactly what it's going to do uh, you two especially that the design of it is they'll get their personal ID codes and they'll have it all imprinted on 27 so when they decide to take off they click out and go to 27 without anybody's help or anything else and that's the epilogue to Lifeline. What do you girls think of that? It's taking the express instead of the local. I like <laughs> it. I like it a lot. I think it would be extraordinarily valuable for people who work in hospice situations, both with the the patient and with the family. It would be a wonderful support and assistance to people in that situation. Uh, we've uh, had very profound illustrations of that over the years, and it as is the obvious thing friends of ours who were in a terminal situation and, and extreme pain and uh, uh, the key one is is the friend next door or uh, who uh, the building is named after this friend next door who we did give him that process and he was he was in a not exactly a nursing home but some type of caring facility and he so desperately wanted to leave we took the tape over to him with his wife's consent and knowledge. I don't know about the doctors. 
In a week he was gone, after being there for eight months, a week after he was gone. And um, uh, so there are illustrations like that through the years where uh, these happened because of the need or the opportunity. And here we are, if we can make this conversion and have that, as I say, the epilogue uh, to Lifeline, where we can teach people in the hospice environment to do and utilize this system. At least uh, uh, if we can uh, keep Ted Koppel out of here, we'll be in pretty good shape. <laughs> but uh, that's, we'll probably, it's in work now, but when it'll begin to surface, probably sometime next year. But tomorrow is still now in that respect. So uh, that's, I thank you both for being here on the whole process of talking about Lifeline. And uh, as you know, we got the other one. We have what we call in our tomorrows now, we have the Mark II guidelines, which has been in existence for some six years. And we have modified it piece by piece over the years, but just within this last session that we had, we modified the whole program, and uh, Mark Serto, our super engineer sound processor, he did just make it to get them all done, but he did. And what does this new guidelines do? Well, what it did is the point. <laughs> it was, uh, it was so profound that we had to start a cooling down process right in the middle of it because we're using all the methods and techniques involved in the Lifeline program we inserted into guidelines. So they did develop their own personal idea and began to use it and label it all over the place. They labeled Focus 10, 12, 15, and 21 and I got them all in their personal idea and they got there with absurd ease then. If they wanted to go to 10 they simply uh, thought of Focus 10 with a 10 beside it and uh, their ID with their 10 beside it and all of a sudden they're in 10. So it worked very well. The only problem that we found out was that they didn't want to come back out of 20, oh, to 23 or something like that, but they didn't want to come back out of 21. So we had to reinstitute it for the next guidelines that they came back at a slower rate instead of this pop back because a lot of them says, oh, well, I can get back on and they didn't hurry back. And Guidelines, however, in itself has a different approach, and that different approach is that uh, the first half of it is devoted to the process of learning to uh, make contact and ongoing communication with what is commonly called the ish or inner self-helper of each individual. And this is not our acronym. This is one developed by various psychologists or recognized as such, especially those doing work in a multiple personality dysfunction. They found that each one of the, among the multiple personalities of an individual are these patterns of, of different various ones. But there seems to be a consistent one who is more in a uh, personality who is more in the observer status and has uh, apparently a serenity, a wisdom, and knowledge that none of the other personalities has. And so what uh, the first half of guidelines is designed to get people in communication, in touch with this ish of oneself. And it was most interesting is that it became very, very strong. And, and again, that profundity that... Uh, made us have to slow up a little bit. They're, uh, they're having difficulty in handling it. And that was the first new guidelines, and that was just recently. The other thing that was in guidelines was the fact that we did this. And as we both of you well know, uh, we take a position that everything is a phase relationship. And so what we did in our on finally, after all these many years, I say tomorrow is now, what we did is that we had the second half of this new guidelines was phasing and learning how to phase in what 
uh, might be defined as the out-of-body state, actually, genuinely so. And we gave them practice in the system of doing that, of phasing into the out-of-body state. So if in the future someone uh, says, well, I want to learn how to go out of my body, if they get all the way past through gateway, because this is a graduate program, into guidelines, they'll learn how to go out of the body. But they, again, will have the very thing that both of you know, and that is uh, the detachment, the objectivity, the lack of fear. Do that, and they can avoid all these very heavy, heavy bumps that are in the road. So you see, tomorrow is now. And uh, now we get to one of the things that has been much in our mind for many years, and finally we're doing something about it. It wasn't until uh, two or three years ago, or maybe longer, I get lost in time, where we finally were able to do extensive brain mapping here, and we made the obvious discovery, and we've since uh, made the statement, and that is that everything we do is based on stages of sleep and that we've been for years one of the most proficient sleep-inducing uh, organizations uh, in the United States, if not the world, and we are doing it with sound and not drugs. And because of that, uh, we found that what we call Focus 10 is uh, one of the early stages of sleep, and Focus 21, we're up into the stage 3 sleep, that type of thing. So. All of this led down to a basic conclusion that if we're that good in terms of, of evoking sleep in individuals, why not put it out with the public instead of just the limited people who know about us? And that led to a new label in our lives, and that one is called time out. Time out. So you take time out for sleep. So therefore, in this fall of 1991, we are, quote, going public, which means uh, disseminating and distributing very widely and through advertising, a series, first of all, of tapes that have been so highly successful with us in inducing sleep. And we are going to offer a package of four timeout tapes in uh, the public marketplace. And we're going to go first heavily for the insomniacs who... Uh, our statisticians tell us are listening to late night TV. So Time Out and the sale of Time Out tapes will first start in late night on television. And we don't expect any of you particularly to st stay up nights. You don't need them. But this would be the first major step and it will, we will begin uh, late night TV spots in Richmond, Virginia first, and then move to the West Coast for the second test. And if these are as successful as we hope they will be, we then will begin uh, adding market by market until we have, what, 100, 200 TV stations carrying our spots on timeout sleep tapes. And that it will be the beginning of this whole new process. The second part is that this is but a leader into the... Uh, sale of other types of tapes that relate to sleep and doing things during sleep, like becoming more healthy, even to having fun during sleep with unusual kinds of dreams. This is all a part of the timeout process. And then beyond that, we have something very, very vital, and that is that we expect within three years to have this whole timeout sleep-producing public uh, uh, purveyance into hardware, and that's another way of saying electronic devices, they do not use tapes, but in do, instead simply through our super microprocessor uh, chip technology of our world today are simply little devices that do produce sleep. And uh, I have with me our Dave Wallace, who is our one of our key people here who also is our project engineer and Dave has been in charge of helping put together these various electronic devices. Dave, what's the progress in them? Amazing progress. The first device we've been working on, the sleep processor, it's a solid state microprocessor based device 
that works with what's called embedded algorithms. We have written programs in machine language that in turn will produce very powerful sound patterns in Hemisync that will allow you to go from your waking state into sleep and then run you through complete 90 minute human sleep cycles and then at the pre-programmed time wake you up. So it means in essence that you're sleep programming and this is just pure sleep programming and we'll be there all night, is that right? Yes, that's correct. We have three different 90 minute sleep cycles that will basically get you to sleep and then cycle you normally through sleep aiming at REM and delta sleep all the normal components of a restful night's sleep and then allow you to wake up exactly when you have programmed it in the morning. And there's a, uh, just to show how far this goes, uh, there is a modification of that that uh, will indeed let you adjust the duration of each cycle of sleep. You can expand your delta sleep, you can exp expand your REM sleep or your dreaming sleep. And these are, by changing or adjusting uh, this SP2, you can do these types of things. And we have some eight other devices that will add to this in either advanced form or simplified form. And this is where we're going in that tomorrow, which is now. And the first device right now is being tested. The, the SB1 is up at Brown University, isn't it, eh? Yes, that's right. It's being evaluated in our sleep lab right now. And uh, we have uh, uh, another university that apparently is eager to uh, conduct tests with it so that we will in turn have the sleep labs in well knowledgeable control. And we look forward to this as being a massive change and within perhaps uh, three to four years we won't have any tapes anymore. They will all be electronic devices because some of the new ones uh, two or three years from now will have a plug-in module that would work almost like a tape cassette, only be much, much more efficient. So anyway, I just wanted you to know, all of you there, where we are here, and what we're doing, which is simply nothing more or less than bringing and saying tomorrow is now. <laughs>